So we're moving on to um, uh, our next speaker, and that's Alan Dewar, who's going to be speaking to us about Bali Yellow Dwarf virus. Uh, so Dr. Alan Dewar has over 40 years of experience in agricultural entomological research in institutes within the BBSRC, uh, including the Institute of Grassland and Environment, Environmental Research, Rothamsted Research and Brooms Barn Research Centre. His research includes the ecology and forecasting of cereal aphids, plus extensive work on pest control in sugar beet, for which he has a worldwide reputation. He's been involved in, the, in developing most of the currently successful pest control measures used by UK sugar beet growers, including seed treatments, nematicides and foliar sprays. In the last 15 years, since 2007, uh, when he set up his own crop protection com company focusing on carrying out field trials, for the agronomy, uh, sorry, for the agrochemical industry. Dr. Dewar and his team have conducted over 250 trials on a wide variety of crops and disciplines, including many on cereal crops targeting uh, aphids carrying BYDV. Uh, entomology remains the most important core business uh, within the company. And in that respect, he has given many lectures on pest control in cereals, oilseed rape and sugar beets in the last 15 years to growers, uh, and agronomist audiences around the UK and Europe. Excellent. So over to Alan. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, or good afternoon, sorry. Uh, I, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to match the sophistication of some of the research described by Sam and her colleagues there. Um, it's going to be more uh, pedestrian than that but uh, we'll do our best. I just thought you might, uh, I might, might remind you that I've been working in cereal aphids for 45 years or more, uh, and this is what it does to you. Uh, the picture on the left was taken around about 1977 when I started at Rothamsted, and the picture on the right was taken about a couple of months ago, and you can see the damage that has been done after 45 years in this business. I'm going to address the subject of IPM and cereals by using this, these headings derived from the Sustainable Use Directive, uh, which I think originally was an EU thing and may still be a part of our post-Brexit strategy in this area, but uh, information on this can be garnered from this reference at the bottom. I won't dwell on these headings at the moment, I'll bring them up again as I go through this talk. So uh, the first question is achieving prevention and suppression of harm, harmful organisms. What are the harmful organisms with regard to BYDV? Well, BYDV infection is caused by several strains of virus. Some virologists would call them species. Um, they're in the group the luteoviruses and all of them are transmitted by aphids and only aphids. The most common strains in the UK include the PAV strain, MAV and RPV. And these names refer a little bit to the species of aphids that can transfer, transmit them. I'll talk about that in a moment. The latter strain, RPV, has been classed as a polarovirus within luteoviridae. That's more news to our virologists than it is to many of you, I'm sure. Um, I thought I'd have a quick look at uh, what the target pests are for, uh, for example, wheat in the UK, uh, the major cereal grown. Um, this data derived from pesticide usage surveys uh, operated by, uh, uh, paid for by DEFRA and operated by FERA. And it shows quite clearly in wheat in the last three PUS surveys that cereal aphids are by far the major target pest in wheat. And the same is true for winter barley. Uh, there's hardly any other pests mentioned in the survey results. Um, in fact, I was quite surprised to see the most recent survey results in 2020 showing cereal leaf beetle to be a pest in winter barley in, in the year that that survey was done, 2020. So cereal leafids are the main problem and uh, I'll say a little bit about the species that we are talking about here. Um, with regard to BYDV transmitted in the autumn, uh, the bird cherry oat aphid, 
to give it its correct name, the Palasiphon pedi, is the most important species. Uh, here you can see what it looks like under a microscope or a hand lens. Uh, it's, uh, it's olive green in colour, uh, sort of oval shape with orange coloration around the cornicles at the back end and it's got a rather blunt co coda. Uh, but for most of you who come across these in the field, they look like specks of dirt on the bottom of cereal plants and you can see how that might be in, in this picture on the right. Uh, as I said, uh, this species is an important pest on wheat, barley and oats from a BYDV perspective and the two strains that transmits are PAV and RPV. These were formerly controlled very well by the seed treatment containing uh, anidin, which um, has recently been banned in 2019, and, and they still are well controlled with pyrethroids. There is a slight fly in the ointment though, uh, just recently a pyrethroid resistant stroke tolerant clone of PEDI um, was recorded in Ireland. This is research reported by Leal et al in 2021. Uh, so we need to keep an eye on things in case this particular trait comes over to the UK. It has quite a tricky life cycle to understand. Originally, the species was a heterocious host alternating species and in some countries still is uh, more or less completely uh, host, uh, host alternating. The host alternation is from a primary host, uh, Prince Pedus, the bird sherry, uh, and uh, the secondary hosts are Gramini, uh, especially Poeshi. Now the reason why this species is such a problem uh, as a BYDV vector is when uh, you have the evolution of asexual forms that don't host alternate and it's these ones here that circulate continuously within Gramini that cause the main problem for spreading BYDV around. The, the morphs or the, or the clones that uh, are affected by photoperiod to produce sexuals in the autumn, um, they, f they produce a, 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 a winged female morph called gynopery, uh, which fly back to Prinspedus trees, give birth to ovipary, which by the time they are mature, then mate with males that have produced on the gramine, and uh, that leads to the laying of eggs, um, which will winter. Uh, clearly you can see that because the virus does not survive through the egg stage, or, or the Prinspedus, that this part of the life cycle is, is quite benign from a BYD view perspective and it's this part, this part of the life cycle, the asexual reproduction of these aphids that cause the main problem. There is a way of distinguishing, if I take, just take you back to this one, at this stage where you get uh, what are called virgin operae produced that, that stay in gramine and gynoperae. Hello? Is that a problem? No, I think we just lost you briefly, Alan. I think you, you're back on track again. Oh, sorry. Okay, well, there, to distinguish between those two different fem, uh, female winged, winged morphs in the autumn, there is a test called the Lowell's squash test, where if you uh, pull the aphids apart, sounds gruesome, is gruesome, uh, the colour of the embryos that come out determine what the behaviour of the aphid will be. So uh, when you do that to a virgin opera, an asexual aphid, just the, the um, nymphs turn a dark colour when in ethyl alcohol, whereas uh, a gynopera that would fly back to bird cherry would remain a creamy colour. And knowing the difference between those two allows some information to be made about the risk factors in the autumn. Indeed, uh, Richard Harrington, when he worked in the insect survey, uh, produced a graph like this, which showed that if you look at the mean temperatures between December and February in the year before the, the autumn that we're considering, 
then when the temperature are high, the proportion of serial colonizers becomes higher. When the temperatures remain low, the proportion of serial colonizers remains low. And that's quite a high R squared value describing that. Moving on then to the other aphid species, which is a feature of BYDV in the UK, and that is the grain aphids Dobin vini. It's more of a pest, or it has in the past been regarded as more of a pest uh, in the summer, especially on the ears of wheat. Um, you can get different colour morphs, green and dark red. Uh, it reduces grain yield in this circumstance, but it also transmits BYDV in the autumn. And those strains that it transmits are the MAV strain and the PAV strains. Again, good control is previously given by deter seed treatments and pyrethroids, but control failures from pyrethroids were reported in the summer of 2011 and in the springs of 2012 and 2016. This aphid doesn't normally have a sexual life cycle in the UK, but, but it can do in, uh, in some situations and when it does, a uh, sexual cycle still takes place on graminy. <clears throat> Coming to the second of the uh, initiative directive, uh, monitoring of harmful organisms. Um, because aphids must migrate into cereal fields each autumn, their migrations can be monitored by suction traps, by sticky traps and by water traps and also by direct observation in crops, such as the way I was behaving in that first slide. All of these require the services of an entomologist to be sure that, that you know what you're looking at. The last one requires very good eyesight, and I, I have actually uh, invested in times three and a half reading glasses from Boots. That helps me a little bit these days, but it also helps if you've had entomological training to identify what you're looking at. Turning to suction traps first off, which is where I started my career at Rothamsted. Um, the suction trap network should be well known to you all by now. There are 16 traps in operation around the country. This is what they look like, 40 feet high or 12.2 metres. Um, some of them have been in operation since 1965, and that includes the one at Rothamsted, the one at Brooms Barn in Suffolk, just down the road from me. Uh, and that data set is invaluable when trying to interpret what is going on from year to year. All of that is available on this website at the bottom. <clears throat> A whole team of entomologists is required to, to uh, sift through the samples that are collected by these 16 traps and here is a picture of one from the Rothamsted Insect Survey front page. I used to be one of these people back in 1976 um, and that's where I learned my trade. But also uh, on, on top of the information available through Rothamsted's website, this information is also reproduced in the AHDB website on this page here, where there is a UK aphid monitoring network. And that also includes lots of other information about what's going on with aphids in the UK. It's an extremely good source of information and uh, very good to take a note of this website because trying to find it going through the AHDB front pages is, is quite tricky. I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of how trap catches can be used to uh, appreciate or maybe even forecast what might be going on in the field. And I've chosen a couple of years to illustrate that. First off, in 2012, uh, 2012 was a, an epidemic year. So the autumn of 2011, 2012 was quite important. And if you look at the suction trap graphs that are produced by the insect survey, which are extremely useful to me at least, you can see what was going on in that year. The green uh, bars are the mean values for the previous 10 years. So that gives you a kind of an idea of what's going on with the species. And then we have individual years uh, imposed on top of that. I would just very quickly point out that in 2011, 
the numbers of aphids were, were of this species, Pedi, at the Brooms Barn Trap in Suffolk down the road from me were considerably higher than the mean for the previous 10 years. And at the end of that particular migration period, there was a little blip right into December, which was unusual. If you then come forward to the 2012 year, you can see that that species started migrating early and not surprisingly, we got um, a lot of BYDD the following spring. Uh, looking at the grain aphid in the same year, you can see in that year it, it has a main peak in the summer and a little peak in the autumn, unlike Pedi. But you can see in the year 2011, in that particular uh, species, there was also a blip um, which contributed to the epidemic of BYDV the following spring. A second, and this is the kind of picture that uh, emanated in places where uh, insecticides perhaps had not been used or had been used too early and not been able to catch the late migration that occurred. Uh, I do have another example of this, um, but I'm conscious of the time, so I think I'll just leave it as a, as a, a, a part of the presentation that will be available later, but it, it showed similar sorts of effects in 2015-16 high numbers of paid eye uh, above normal, bearing in mind this is a log scale, high numbers above normal in the end of the season, high numbers at the beginning of the season, even into May, and that contributed to uh, an another BYDV epidemic. And the same happened with Sitobi Navini with a blip in 2015 autumn and a high number in 2016 spring. And this is what we saw just down the road from me in Suffolk, where this BYDV incidence was caused by the Zetobi and Avini that, that I think were resistant to barethroids and proved to be so when tested because this field was sprayed twice with barethroids and it didn't stop the BYDV. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just pass this over without saying something about what might happen next year. So this is what happened last autumn, looking at the 2021 data uh, for PEDI, the numbers dropped off quite soon. There hasn't been a blip in the, in the late part of the, aut of the autumn winter this season. So my feeling is that there isn't going to be a BYDV epic ne next spring. And the same is true when you look at the Sutobi Navini numbers, they dropped off by uh, late September in uh, 2021 with nothing recorded since then. So I think it might be on safe ground for next year. The other traps I mentioned are yellow water traps and, uh, and sticky traps. Uh, I like water traps. I hate sticky traps. Identifying things with sticky traps is a complete nightmare as far as I'm concerned. Much easier to do with these, but these again do require the skills of an entomologist. The benefits are that they allow you to look at uh, um, more local uh, uh, numbers of insects rather than the more regional uh, information that comes from the suction traps. Moving on to SUD3, decisions should be made based on monitoring and thresholds. Well, there aren't very many thresholds for BYDV uh, aphid control in, in cereals. Uh, I think this example here, 10% of plants infested is all you'll find in the literature. So in practice, growers and agronomists assume that the only good aphid is a dead one. And in the absence of seed treatments, which is the situation now, sprays are applied when the first aphid is seen or often as part of a program, regardless of whether aphids have been seen or not. This approach, of course, is what needs to change. That needs better information on the threat of virus infection, including infectivity indices for each region in the country using trap data. And this in turn requires information on the proportion of the aphids carrying viruses and the proportion of those aphids that are resistant to brethroids as a guide to choice insecticides. 
not that there is much choice, which I'll come to later. Um, just to give you an example of what is being done as we speak, here is the latest information from uh, Rothamsted, um, information provided by Martin Williamson on the HDB website, showing what proportion of aphids that were caught in suction traps at these locations, York, Hereford, Broomsbarn, Starcross and Edinburgh, were carrying virus? <clears throat> and the answer is quite a lot. Somewhere between 20 and 25% of Rapala siphon pedi were carrying virus in the autumn of 21. What was an even bigger surprise to me was that the proportion of those that were RPV infected was relatively high. And I'd always thought that that virus strain was very rare, according to the literature in the last century at least. So we might need to rethink uh, um, how we deal with that, with uh, the proportion of RPV being much higher than expected, especially from a breeding perspective. Just to uh, give you a more complete picture there, um, the same tests were done on much fewer numbers of Satobi Navini, and they proved to be infected as well, somewhere between seven and a half and 25%, all with the PAV or MAV strain. <clears throat> of course, the RPV strain wouldn't be expected to be in that species. <clears throat> it's possible to look back in time at wh wh where these virus, uh, it's, sorry, not, not back in time, ch change of that. Uh, resistance uh, to, to perithroids is also a feature of at least one of the species that we're talking about, that is Chitobi Navini. And this proved to be the case after the 2012 epidemic. And when uh, it was possible to look back at old samples stored in alcohol at Rothamsted, it was shown that resistant <coughs> aphids to perithroids first became uh, seen in 20, two, 2009. Curtin in Lincolnshire and rapidly increased to around about 50% level in Suffolk and in Lincolnshire by 2015. The level at Rothamsted was a little bit less than that, not quite sure why that would be, it's still in an animal area, but the fact is that resistance in the species is quite common. Since 2015 there hasn't been much information available due to lack of funding, but more recently in this report, uh, published uh, in 2021, uh, funded by HDB and carried out by Steve Foster at Rothamsted and Daniel Labour and, and colleagues at ADAS, <coughs> looking at the pyrethroid sensitivity of aphids. <coughs> the key findings were that nothing much has changed since 2015. Uh, still between 40 and 50% of Sidobi Nivini uh, are carrying resistance. Um, and, but the good news, good news is that none of the 21 RPDI samples that were tested in that year showed any uh, resistance to the prethroid tests. So for the moment, nothing much has changed. I'm going to skip that one for lack of time and move on to non-insecticidal methods of controlling BYDV in cereals. The first of these is to remove volunteer cereals before sowing a new crop, because volunteers, which are present through the summer, are available for colonization by aphids flying in September. And if you don't remove the volunteers, then you can end up with a problem. Here is an example. Uh, in an experiment that was funded by Bayer that we carried out uh, recently, uh, we actually sowed volunteers. I know that sounds stupid, but we sowed wheat volunteers in an area of land that we were eventually going to plant winter barley in. Um, and we inoculated those volunteers with virus infected pedi. When uh, the crop was subsequently sown, uh, we looked at what happened to the aphids 35 days after sowing. And you can see that where the volunteers were present at the time of sowing, 
numbers of aphids in the plants was relatively high on the sown crop. They'd moved off the volunteers onto the sown crop. The, the Sotobi Navini that occurred in this particular trial were naturally uh, occurring. In the area where we removed the volunteers by spraying with glyphosate on the 21st of September, nine days before sowing uh, and 16 days after sowing, uh, the number of aphids was significantly reduced to about a third of what we had when the volunteers were left. Just a couple um, of minutes, Alan. However, Sorry? A couple more minutes, Alan. Okay. Uh, what was important about this is the timing of the spraying of glyphosate before the new crop was sown. If you wait till the day or even a day before sowing, this is what can happen. The aphids just move off the volunteers onto your newly emerging crop and if they're carrying virus, they will spread it around. So the next, the second point on that, that previous SUD slide was a sowing date. You can delay sowing date to avoid the migration period. Um, but what's interesting about that is that that is tending to happen by default anyway. Uh, this is a, a slide of sowing dates provided by my friend Stephen Moss, which showed that there was a tenfold increase in early sowing of wheat between 1970 and 2012. Uh, and, but since 2012, when we had that epidemic BYDV, for example, there's been a fall off in sowing date back to more um, later times. I'd like to say this was uh, a response, an IPM response, if you like, to uh, controlling aphids, but in fact, I think it's driven by the need to control black grass. And delaying <coughs> drilling helps control black grass, and I think that's the driver there. But that will have had an effect on the frequency um, of um, <coughs> BYDV and cereals. There is a slight danger of employing that um, strategy, though. Uh, according to this graph produced by Ellie Marshall in 2017, there's a fall off in yield with later drillings. I'm not sure that this is necessarily a, a high correlation coefficient here, but certainly if you delay drilling beyond the end of October, you definitely end up in low yield categories. And the third point in that last SUD slide was to use resistant varieties. Now, there are resistant varieties now available out there. They're in, in specialist categories. Currently in the UK, uh, winter barley, there are two varieties, Amistar and Arfaella. Uh, and in winter wheat, there's Wolverine. I've been doing some work recently with uh, one of the breeders in the UK, and you can see that there are some big differences between the varieties. In this particular experiment, we inoculated the plots in the 16th of September. And this photograph was taken uh, in the middle of December. And it shows quite clearly that some varieties are extremely susceptible to BYDV and some are not. So there is hope there for the future. However, for resistant varieties to be acceptable to the industry at large, they need to be high yielders. They need to not be susceptible to other diseases that require quite expensive fungicide treatments, for example, because that would undermine savings that you make by not using insecticide. They also need to be resistant to any other insect transmitted diseases, such as wheat dwarf virus, so that insecticides could be avoided altogether. And wheat dwarf virus is actually becoming more of an issue in one part of Norfolk that I've been monitoring with um, agronomist friends in the area. So my question to the breeders out there is, are stacked resistance genes to multiple diseases likely to be an option in the future? When it comes to pesticide selection, there isn't much. In the last 10 years, you can see in this list, with the exception of chlorpyrifos, which was banned after this last one here, 
all of these insecticides are pyrethroids. There is nothing else. And in fact, there is nothing else approved for use in the autumn either. So since the post-neonicotinic ban, neonic ban, uh, we're still faced with problems uh, of controlling aphids with current synthetic pesticides. So we need, let's move on, we need urgent need for alternative chemistry, giving resistance situation with Strobinibini, and a higher risk of selection for resistance to PAI. I just wanted to clear up something that maybe some uh, person in the green lobby might come up with. How come we've got fewer pyrethroids used in 2019, a year after the ban, than in the year before when the ban was still in place? Well, almost certainly all of this effect was due to the incredibly bad weather that autumn. It was not, not, not anything to do with deliberate choices by the farmer. There simply wasn't enough wheat sown to spray. And that's why these figures are lower than in 2017. So <clears throat> just to finish off then, uh, in the last point in the SUD list was evaluation. Uh, and how do we evaluate how IPM works? Well, first of all, we can still carry on with the surveys and the use of pesticides, which is already done through the PUS. But what I think is missing in the BYDV story is that we've got no reliable uh, surveys of the incidence of BYDV across the country. And that's because it's not done regularly, but it's also difficult to, uh, to choose situations that you could include in a, in a survey because insecticides work against the main vector of the virus, it gives a false impression about how important BYDV is in any particular region or any particular year. So what needs to be set up is a, a survey that looks at untreated crops or part crops every year, and then we can try and get a handle on whereby BYDV needs to be controlled and how. Just a glimpse of the future to finish off. This is my last slide. Uh, I haven't got time to go into detail on any of these, uh, but this, uh, this kind of um, gives higher technology approaches to BYDV control than I've talked about so far. Uh, it includes um, GM type features. Uh, modified virus derived resistance, etc. Field testing kits, I think, for individual aphids would be useful. Uh, if all varieties were carrying re resistance to the BYDD, um, that would be useful as well because we wouldn't need any insecticides at all. But as I said, that's going to be tricky introducing that resistance into high yielders. Biopesticides, which I haven't talked about, could include neem oils of cumin, hyssop, etc. And of course, there's always uh, conservation control to consider. Although I must say in the autumn, it's difficult to imagine how that could be done with, uh, for example, hoverflies, uh, because they rely on flowering plants to be around and there aren't many of those in the autumn. At the end of all that, I'll just say good luck to anybody out there who's trying to implement these IPM methods. Thank you very much.